Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. My guest today is Dr. Annalisa Cox. She is a fellow at Harvard's Hutchins Center for African and African American Research. And she is the author of a new book, which actually comes out uh, the day after this episode drops. So this book comes out on June 12th, which is The Bone and Sinew of the Land, America's Forgotten Black Pioneers and the Struggle for Equality. Uh, Well, hi, Annalisa. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks. So we, we chatted for a few minutes before we started recording, and um, your enthusiasm for this topic just burst through the, the internet <laughs> all the way to Europe, where I'm sitting. And um, one of the the things that I was curious about when when um, I started looking at this topic for a topic for the show is just I my ignorance. I didn't know that there were Black pioneer communities. It makes sense, but I guess in my head, most of the African American settlements. Uh, we're post Civil War, and so I, I'm excited for you to fill in this whole chapter that I don't know anything about. How did you get interested in this topic? Boy, I have to say I got interested in this topic after my first book came out, and I I want to dial back a little bit and say it's interesting. You're not the first person who has said, "Oh gosh, I feel so ignorant that I didn't know about these settlements and this." movement of African-American pioneers long before the Civil War, but people really shouldn't because this has really been a lost history. I know almost no one who knows of this history. It's been really buried. Um, and I think it's because there, there's sort of a triple hit against this history, at least a triple hit. So it takes place in the Northwest Territory, but it's a region now known as the Midwest, and so that's sort of the flyover zone for a lot of people on the coasts. Um, and these are African Americans. They're rural. They're pioneer. And they lived a really long time ago. So, I mean, that's sort of, you know, that's a lot of the reasons why people don't know about it. But um, I think I started getting interested in it a while back when my first book came out and I was on book tour. And no matter where I went, whether it was Portland, Oregon, or Miami, Florida, invariably somebody would be in line and they'd say to me, well, I'm sure you've heard about this community or that community that my grandparents grew up in or my great-grandparents grew up in. And I'd go back home and I'd check out that community. And not only had I not heard of that community, but it looked like nobody had heard of that community. There was nothing about it in the historical record. And I began to realize as I dug that I was basically coming across our nation's first great migration. This is a movement of tens of thousands of free African Americans onto the nation's first free frontier. And by that, I mean the Northwest Territory. And a lot of people think Washington State or You know, the Northwest, we've got an idea of what the Northwest is. But in 1787, when this piece of land was set aside, it was actually our nation's first territory. This is before the Louisiana Purchase. And um, the 1787 Northwest Territorial Ordinance was a truly radical document. It wasn't always applied and kept to in a very good way. But when it was originally written, it was truly revolutionary. So it made this region, which became the states of Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, and the little smidge of Minnesota, uh, into the largest piece of land ever to be set aside as free from slavery in the New World. So this is this is just a big deal. And then on top of that, Something that a lot of people miss, but really is truly revolutionary, is that this document allowed for equal voting rights 
for blacks and whites. So true, you had to be male. You had to be over the age of 21. You had to own at least 50 acres of land and live in a region for about three years. But there, the word white to define citizenship or any other definition of who a sort of citizen would be in this region is never used. I've actually, when I teach uh, courses, I've asked students if they can find the word white anywhere in this document, I'll give them $5. And so far, I'm still $5 richer. (laughs) So how did the Northwest Territories Charter come to be written like that? You know, I've thought about this a, a bit. It was it was actually written at the same time as our national constitution. And at times, the men who were writing this were actually in pubs just down the road from each other in Philadelphia. I like to think of them running back and forth to each other, checking out what kind of beer was at these <laughs> pubs. And of course, this is a, a gross oversimplification, right? But truly, the constitution was written with a lot of cooks in the kitchen. And there were a lot of compromises made. And some of them were truly prejudicial. They were pro-slavery. They, we are still feeling the effects of them today. But the Northwest Territorial Ordinance could be in many ways more idealistic or even more utopian because, bluntly, uh, the men in Philadelphia who were working on it weren't actually listening that closely to indigenous people in the region, nor um, that much to the French, uh, who were mainly peopling that uh, this region. So they could sort of create something out of whole cloth. And these really were the ideals of the time. I know, like, everybody can get obsessed about the founding fathers. I'm really interested in the founding people, black and white, during this period. And what they envisioned for this nation really was revolutionary. They really did, many of them really did believe in that wonderful phrase, all men are created equal. In fact, New Jersey got so radical that it actually allowed women to vote for a brief period of time. But um, this was this was a period of um, extraordinary sort of enlightenment era uh, revolutionary thought. And Americans who had fought in a very difficult war, which was torn by division and prejudice, and historians have rightly pointed to the fact that racism was actually used during the revolution to um, foment violence. But after the revolution was over, um, people across the United States were really doing um, extraordinarily equality-minded things. Um, People were... um, Uh, Whites were freeing enslaved people that they owned. Enslaved people were going to court to argue for their freedom, and they were winning. Um, And uh, there was just, it was a heady time, truly. And uh, in fact, in 17, I think 1792, um, uh, but it was when George Washington was running for re-election as president. At that time, uh, the vast majority of states in America had equal voting rights for black and white men. And we've kind of lost um, that particular portion. So the Northwest Territory was being created out of this perfect storm where there were people, African-descended people who were long free, but also thousands and thousands of African-descended people were gaining their freedom, many of them in interesting sort of financial relationships with the people who enslaved them, where they were being told if they earned uh, enough to sort of repay the people who enslaved them, they could be free. And a lot of people, these people who I call freedom entrepreneurs, uh, were gaining their freedom this way. I mean, in all honesty, as abolitionists were saying during this period, truly, the enslavers should have been paying the enslaved people for all the money they owe them for all the unpaid wages they never got. <laughs> but, you know, um, it, yeah, it was so much harder to be an African descended pioneer to the frontier than it was to be white uh, for a lot, lot of reasons. Um, yet these people were willing to take the challenge to start a new life. And I think they also really envisioned helping to create the new nation, right? Um, they really, they had a notion of what, uh, 
this region should look like and what the nation should look like in the earliest days of this nation. Um, and uh, but of course, like I have to admit, while numbers are amazing, the numbers are amazing. I'm, uh, I was able to find over three hundred African American farming settlements oh, across wow. these five states. Yep, by eighteen fifty. That means, and these settlements are not just one family, they're multiple, oftentimes multiple families with successful, massive farms on them. And uh, this is a real change in how we think about this region and how we think about even the United States before the Civil War. Because when I first started this research, the assumption was that there were three, maybe five such settlements across these five states. So this is just, this is a big, big difference. But I have to admit, I'm not a statistical historian. I really love the intimate history of people's lives. I think that a lot of historians are at heart very nosy people. (laughs) And I love being able to read old diaries and look at archives and, um, you know, go up in people's attics and really find out the the daily lives of what it looked like to be a pioneer and and what it was like to live at that time, which is why I decided to write this book, not just sort of as a statistical history. I'm like, oh, here's five states and here's tens of thousands of people and here's hundreds of settlements and let's break this out in a lot of tables. I could (laughs) have. I definitely have that skill. (laughs) But um, I know there's enough people out there who find that kind of history boring and in the end, these are extraordinary people who were not boring in the least. And I felt like if I made them boring, I'd probably just like never be able to forgive myself. So, so let's talk about a couple. Who were some of the, the stories that stood out to you? I really, you know, I start the book with the Greer family, with Charles and Keziah Greer uh, on the early, earliest frontier of the Northwest Territory. And they're there before statehood. They're in what would later become Indiana, but at the time was just territory. Um, Unlike some of the pioneers that I studied, and there's many, many different kinds, there were some that had been families that came in entire wagon trains who had been free for generations, who had been landowning farmers in North Carolina and Virginia since the 1600s, so just for generations, who were descended from patriots who'd fought in the Revolutionary War. But Charles and Keziah Greer really intrigued me because they started with nothing. They were brought basically enslaved into that region. Charles was brought into the territory by a pastor who had been given him in a will and who was adamantly against slavery, so much against it that he was willing to give up the wealth that this person called Charles Greer represented um, and actually walk or travel into the Indiana Territory with Charles Greer and uh, another friend and uh, free him there. But then Charles Greer basically had nothing. Like He just had himself, but he obviously had a lot of good farming skills. And he was able, he was freed in 1813. And by 1815, he was able to buy his first 40 acres of frontier land. And he obviously wanted to wait until he had really got that started to be cleared before he married but he must have been falling in love with a young woman called Keziah, who had been brought into the Indiana Territory illegally enslaved from South Carolina. So she'd been brought very young as a teenager. And I can't even imagine how difficult that must have been for her to be taken from everything that she knew, everything she was familiar with, probably family and friends in South Carolina, to the Indiana frontier to work in bondage and uh, as a teenager. And there was a a terrible practicality to this. A lot of enslaving whites who were bringing 
their enslaved people to the Northwest Territorial Frontier illegally, but doing so anyway, would often bring the youngest, healthiest people they could, and that often meant 13, 14, or 15-year-olds. Uh, so, because Zaya was very young when she was brought there, I I can't even imagine what it was like seeing her first snowfall, um, being there alone, and having to do the work of a pioneer on the frontier and in a region there, there were still wolves roaming. Um, it was uh, it was an extremely hostile and difficult environment, but she managed to survive it, and she and Charles uh, managed to find each other. And uh, not only that, but Charles, who was this farmer uh, on his own out there, managed to survive the summer uh, where there was no summer, uh, the summer of... Uh, both 1816 and 1817 were devastating for farmers because a volcano had blown up <laughs> somewhere in what we now call Indonesia, and there was no summer. So crops were freezing, snow was falling, uh, and yet he somehow managed to survive, and uh, they managed to meet. And by they got married in 1818 and started farming together. And I follow them. They're one of the families that I follow as they they grow their farm, grow their family, and astoundingly, given everything that they were up against, decide to risk all of that by very, very secretly becoming Underground Railroad agents. Oh, wow. So we recently did an episode about... um... Uh, Josiah Henson, who was a slave that escaped to Canada and then came back and rescued uh, over 100 people on the Underground Railroad. Mm-hmm. And so that's so interesting because part of, you know, when you hear about him or like Harriet Tubman or somebody, you're hearing the story of like the person that's doing the moving. And it's so interesting to hear the story of the people that do the sheltering because yes. in some ways they're very different sets of danger for this same cause, right? What was it like for them yeah. um, to to have their house be as part of the Underground Railroad? And what was it, you know, what what kinds of evidence did you find about their activities? Well, I have to say, first, it's very tricky because, of course, we think of this today as the Underground Railroad. But that was actually a term that was started in the late 1840s as part of a media offensive by abolitionists, uh, most of whom were white and had the legal standing and the wealth to be very open about what they were doing. But uh, many of these African-American farming pioneers were part of an unofficial underground railroad or just, I would say, they were helping, they were risking their lives to help people who were trying to make themselves free. And they were doing it long before there was ever anything called a railroad, uh, <laughs> or anything called trains, right? Um, in fact, I think probably the earliest, it was the waterways. You were getting people uh, out on boats. Uh, one of the earliest ways was getting people up, up the Ohio River to um, Pittsburgh. But it was so much more dangerous for African-descended people to do this. They were already closely watched, they were closely noticed. So the risks they were taking were so much greater. And they faced the fact that they had very little shelter from the law. So for a wealthy white person who hired a lot of the people in your county, either on your farm or in your business, if if you were arrested, you could go to court and defend yourself. But in most of these states, the laws were so prejudiced against them. There was a massive backlash against the Northwest, the ideals of the Northwest Territory. So as each state became a state, starting with Ohio in 1802, voting rights were stolen from African-Americans in each one of these states. The word white was inserted and who could vote. And um, pretty soon, laws were passed, even in the territorial days, which said that African-descended people could not take to court a white person. So there was very little shelter. So the challenges that these um, incredibly heroic people were doing were just 
I can, almost insurmountable, yet they did them. And uh, Charles and Keziah Greer actually ended up being involved in one of the most uh, famous escaped, uh, sort of escape stories of the period before the Civil War. They helped the Still family to escape. This is um, members of the uh, abolitionist, African-American abolitionist Still family based in Philadelphia. And uh, it was, yeah, their decision to get involved in that in the 1850s was really a very, very, very dangerous one. And yet they were willing to do that. What do we, do? do did they go on to have children? Do they have, uh, what, what kind of legacy do they have outside of your research? Or how did you find out about them? Ah, uh, so, yes, these were, many of these pioneers had huge families, um, which I have often thought, like, how did that even look if you were first on the frontier? Because many of them were there before most whites arrived. They were getting really good land. I've come across some settlements in western Wisconsin where African-American pioneers were literally land deed number one. Uh, they were from the federal government. They're, they were coming out early and they were they were getting good land. And then they were starting families. Some of them came with grown children. But I often thought as a woman, what would that be like knowing you were you and your husband were going out to the frontier where there were no sisters, no mothers, no midwives uh, and and having children? Um, It's just, oh, my gosh, the challenges. So there was so much courage involved in this. Um, but they did, they had big, they had big families and for the Greers themselves, they were there, both of them lived a very long time. So they lived to see the civil war and the ending of slavery in the United States. In fact, on Charles Greer's obituary, it says that one of his proudest moments was being able to go to the polls and vote before he just before he died. Oh. Um and it's just yeah, it's it's really moving. A right that he should have had from the first moment he arrived in the Indiana territories, but which had I have to admit William Henry Harrison, who was the young governor of that region, was extremely pro slavery and very prejudiced. And so he'd already made sure um that it was very difficult for people to have many rights. And I'm not sure if he ever had the right to vote um, before Indiana became a state and then stole that right from him. But it was certainly very, very important to him. Um, but I I actually I discovered that community, the community of Gibson County, Indiana, through the work of a woman called Maxine Brown, who's, been, who's based in Corridon, Indiana, and has been doing amazing work doing something called the African-American Heritage Trail in Indiana. And through my contacts with her, she was able to tell me about some of the communities that were working to preserve their history. And uh, a man by the name of Stanley Madison has been working very, very hard now to preserve the history of of African-American farmers in Gibson County, who have been owning land and farming there for well over two centuries. And he has a wonderful little museum um, in Gibson County called the Lyles Station Museum. And it's uh, just a wonderful museum. And when I started working with the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture on a large exhibit on this pioneering movement and these African American farming communities, with the curator there, Paul Gardulo. Um, that was the community that Paul decided to focus on for his exhibit uh, because its its history is so rich. But I have to say one of my biggest challenges for this book, and it really was a challenge, it was hard for me, is that every time I turned around, every time I scratched the surface, there was another community who, were, who was also filled with heroic and incredible people with amazing stories. I and mean, there's literally hundreds of these settlements. In my first book, A Stronger Kinship, uh, that's the title of the book, 
was a deep, deep study of just one particular community, uh, farming community in the Midwest. And I really and truly, each one of these communities deserves a book. And so it kind of, oh, it was, sometimes it was just torture, not being <laughs> able to dig deeper into the histories of these fascinating communities and these fascinating people. Uh, I think it would probably take a hundred historians, a hundred years to even start telling this lost history that has been um, buried for so long. So let's, okay, so we have the Greers. What's another family that you really felt Mm -hmm. connected to? I think historians, well, I can't speak for all historians. I know that when I write about people, I really, I grew to care about them very, very deeply. Uh, I know that some members of my family at family reunions would tease me because they would say, look, you know, you, you don't even do genealogy for your own family and you're doing this deep genealogy into, into these families and what are you doing? But I really, they, they were just such amazing people and their stories were so incredible. Um, the other, the other complaint I've often gotten is, why don't you just write novels? You know, you could, you, you write in a novelistic way and it's moving and it's adventurous. And truly, I don't have a good enough imagination to make this stuff up. I mean, the stuff that I've come across and the people I've come across um, are, are so incredible. It's hard to pick a favorite. It really is. Um, I have to say that Cornelius Elliott really really captured my imagination. Uh, He was one of the first that I studied, and he was brought enslaved into southern Illinois in the 18-teens by a man named Timothy Gard, who was a leaseholder on one of the largest saline mines in southern Illinois. Now, this is, you know, we all have visions of what the frontier looks like, right? Wilderness and woods and wild animals and um, all of this. And I should note, of course, Native Americans. And one of the complicating and difficult factors about this history and about this project is that the relationship between African Americans and Native Americans shifts quite profoundly during the period that I'm studying. So early on, there had been um, African-descended people who had been coming into this region since at least the 1720s. Uh, Philippe Reynaud brought a shipload of people up the Mississippi in the early 1720s uh, to try to force them to dig lead mines and create plantations. He was a French courtier, and he had Uh, purchased many of these people on the island of Saint-Domingue, a Caribbean island, which is now called Haiti. And I think that he just didn't think things through very clearly because it's one thing to keep a lot of people enslaved um, when you have a lot of heavily armed Frenchmen on an island in the Caribbean. It's quite another thing to bring people up the Mississippi River and try to force them to work enslaved in wilderness. And he's always a little fuzzy uh, when he gets back to France and he gets back to court about exactly how many people he came back with or how many people he lost, <laughs> which oh, no. makes perfect sense to me. I mean, it's, yeah, um, it's good. Yeah, it's just... Right. <laughs> right. So um, uh, there had long been ever. American descended people in this region. And I know a lot of people who've been to Chicago know about DuSable, who was the first person to sort of have a home and settle what is now Chicago. And he was African descended and French and indigenous and a lot of other things. But then so was his mother. And for all we know, her mother, right? Um, so this history goes way back in this region. But that particular movement of African descended people were multilingual. They spoke um, numerous indigenous languages. They were often uh, fluent in French and English. They were fur traders. They traveled widely. Um, and their relationship 
in with Indigenous people was utterly different than the relationship of African American pioneers moving to this region once it became the United States, once it became the Northwest Territory in 1787. Because black or white, the pioneering project is in opposition to indigenous rights. Bluntly, that's the case. And so the relationship between uh, these African-American pioneers and indigenous people was often extremely hostile. Uh, in fact, during the War of 1812 in this region, um, there were African-American Indian scouts working for William Henry Harrison in the Indiana Territory. Uh, there was an African-American militia raised during the War of 1812 along the Wabash River. And that was a, that was a war in, in this particular region that was really fought um, against and between Native American people. So this is, I understand that one of the difficult things, like a pioneer is just not somebody utterly heroic, right? We're also talking about genocide. We're also talking about many, many horrors here. Um, and uh, so it's a very, very complicated history, and I want to be clear and, and note that. But at the same time, to erase African descended people from the pioneering native, uh, the par- sorry, I need to re say that, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to to erase <laughs> to erase African descended pioneers from the earliest history of sort of the pioneering narrative of this nation, particularly of its first free frontier, is to lose a very important aspect of our American past, because while this was coming hand in glove with some horrific things that were happening to indigenous people in this area, at the same time, uh, African-American pioneers are what I would call the purest pioneers. They're, they're moving not just for economic advancement, they are moving for ideological reasons. They're moving for their rights. They're moving to uh, the frontier to try to create a nation where there can be more freedom and there can be more equality. And they're really, they're, they're, many of them really are activists for this. Um, and sometimes they're doing that very overtly, like the Greers, um, becoming underground railroad agents. Others are founding uh, black conventions, which are these incredible uh, political organizations starting in the Midwest in the 1830s and 1840s, meeting annually, trying to overturn prejudice laws in their states. But others are people like Cornelius Elliott, who just want to have a normal life, a normal successful life like anybody else. But at that time, that dream, Cornelius Elliott's dream, was in itself a revolutionary dream Um, because he was brought from Kentucky to southern Illinois, enslaved to the salt mines of southern Illinois. And this was this was not wilderness. This was the early industrial revolution in the middle of the wilderness. So it was huge pits being dug deep into muddy ground to draw out this salt water. And anybody who's been to the beach and tried to dig a hole in wet sand knows what has happened, right? Uh, It just collapses in on itself. (laughs) So this was deadly and terrible work. And the state of Illinois actually had loopholes in its laws against slavery, allowing slavery in this industry because you couldn't pay people enough to work in those pits. It was deadly work. I often think of Dante's Inferno, actually, whenever I think of the saline salt mines, um, because people were down in this highly salinated water, which caused something called salt ulcers, which would actually sometimes eat the flesh away down to the bone if you stood in it every day for hours. 
and they were trying to shovel wet mud out of these pits to try to get these pipes down deeper and deeper. Some of these pits were 60 or 70 feet deep, but the pits were constantly collapsing. And um, so you had mainly African-descended enslaved people working these pits. And Cornelius Elliott was brought there by Timothy Gard, who owned the largest and the most productive of these what was called salt mines, <laughs> really mud pits. And he had a dream of freedom. He, he had this dream that he would be free and his family would be free and that he could become a farmer. He had some little hope of making it out because he wasn't actually in the pits. He was actually a cooper. He was a highly skilled individual who knew how to work wood and metal and create barrels and buckets. Um, and he was probably also hired to watch the pipes. There was a series of pipes going from these pits across burnt miles, sort of miles of burnt ground to the edges of the forests uh, because they would render the water, the salt water, in massive kettles uh, to create the salt. They would burn this green wood, and the black smoke must have been visible for miles around. Uh, and But of course, when you're rendering saltwater sludge in metal pots, you get rust. So these kettles were constantly failing, and then this scalding salt sludge would fall on anybody who was trying to stir or tend these pots, and so people were also dying terrible burns. Uh, but Cornelius Elliott was working this industry, and he made an agreement with Timothy Gard that he would purchase his own freedom. And again, this is a freedom entrepreneur. There were thousands of them out on the Northwest Territorial Frontier, people who purchased their freedom while enslaved. So that means that they were actually working extra hours uh, and extra time to put aside the money that it would take to purchase themselves. And some of them were actually purchasing their loved ones first. They were purchasing their wives first or their daughters first. Um, but it was a very, very difficult business to get into because how are you going to negotiate with somebody who legally not only owns you, but your labor? Yeah. And so corruption was rife. There were constantly situations where uh, an enslaved person would say to somebody, I really want to be free. I, I can work in the evenings for this other farmer, and uh, I'd like to purchase myself. And maybe the market value of that person is $350. But their enslaver says, well, if you can come up with $600 or $700, then you can be free. And then maybe you are over the years able to come with that money, and then that person turns around and decides that since they know you want to be free, so you're a flight risk, they're just going to sell you to somebody um, further south, Mississippi or New Orleans, and pocket the money. And that happened. That happened a fair amount. But Cornelius Elliott decided to take the risk, and he approached Timothy Gard, and Timothy Gard said it will cost $1,000. This is the late 1810s, and that was just an obscene amount of money. I came across uh, a, some interesting documents in New York City one time from about the mid-1820s, where New York City was investing in new fire trucks. And each of those fire trucks, which of course were wagons, but they had hoses and buckets and, um, you know, all of the things you would need, pumps, all the things you'd need a, a fire wagon to be. And at that time, in the mid-1820s, $500 would buy you a fire truck. So this is an extraordinary amount of money that Cornelius Elliott is going to have to come up with on the frontier in this region. And he does it. In three years, he does it. Oh, wow. He comes up with $1,000. And he purchases himself. And it's obvious he wants to be free, but 
Timothy Guard had not finished digging his pit yet, and he still wanted Cornelius Elliot to stick around. And he had this terrible insurance, and it was Cornelius Elliot's baby brother. And Timothy Guard also owned him. There's no record of whether he had him working down in the pits or not, but it seems it must have been a terrible threat for Cornelius Elliot to be told, if you don't stay, if you don't work for me, I'll make sure your brother goes down in the pits. So Neil Elliot did stick around and continue to work for Timothy Guard, but he also worked on earning money to purchase his brother's freedom. And a few years later, he was able to purchase his, purchase his brother for $500. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interestingly enough, about the same time that Timothy Guard finished finally digging his pit. So uh, there was sort of, I often have wondered uh, whether Cornelius Elliott was, actually had the money earlier than that, and Timothy Guard just wouldn't let the brother go because he was holding holding that over Cornelius Elliott's head. But uh, by the 1890s, Cornelius Elliott's children were still living in that area. They were elderly, but he ended up free and purchasing the freedom of a number of his family members and buying a very large farm. Uh, He was one of those people who bought land deed number one from the state when the state started uh, selling off land that they had. And he got excellent farmland, and he became a very, very successful farmer in that region. And he really, he made that, he made that dream come true. And I've often thought, what kind of courage and what kind of vision does it take to be brought enslaved into a place as horrific as the salt mines of Southern Illinois and hold on to that vision? that you and your family will not only be free, but be successful. Um, I think, I know we, today we talk about grit, we talk about drive, we talk about entrepreneurship and everything. I have nothing compares to this. Nothing compares to this. I'm, I'm humbled every time I come across um, these pioneers, w- uh, what they accomplished. So let's talk about what happened to the communities because obviously, if, if you're rediscovering this history, at some point, we lost touch with the stories, even if, you know, family members or communities knew more. Uh, mm. What happened to the communities after the Civil War? Well, many of them still continued after the Civil War. It's interesting, but one of the earliest projects that W.E.B. Du Bois did, I believe he did it as a graduate student. And I I think it's funny because I'm actually a fellow at the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute at the Hutchins Center. Um, So I love this link. But one of the earliest projects he did, it was in the 18, it was based on the 1890 census. And he was asked to study African-American farmers. And he found that the value of the land owned by African-American farmers in this region, in the Northwest Territory states, that they owned more land and more valuable land than any other region in America at that time. More than in the South, uh, there was there were a few, there were a couple of ranch owners out in what we'd call the West, sort of the Dakotas and stuff, who owned thousands of acres, which sort of skewed the numbers a little bit. But in terms of what people were actually uh, owning in individual families, it was still really extra. I mean, this legacy was still continuing. What I can say is that even before the Civil War, there was backlash against these successful African-American farmers. So um, sometimes they were burned out. Sometimes they were shot shot out, I mean, literally sort of attacked um, and driven off their farms. I know there's a number of incidents I've come across before the Civil War. Um, wealthy mill owners, wealthy farmers, who literally whites would come in after they were, after these, long after these African-American farmers or um, rural entrepreneurs had gotten established and would drive out these African-Americans. 
And there were laws, um, the, the politics and laws of the time that whites were enacting also made it very, very difficult to be a business owner in these regions. It's very difficult to run a farm or run a business if you can't actually be represented in court, if you can't sue somebody in court. And almost all of these states had laws that said, if you're of African descent, you can't sue a white person in court. So this meant that you might be sitting on your front porch one day and you're, you know, you're herd of dairy cows is in a field right there. And, you know, your 10 children are out helping to work the farm. They're sort of ranging in age from little to up into their 20s. And a group of white men could walk onto your farm, walk off your farm with three of those milk cows in front of you. And if the only witnesses were you and your family, there were no witnesses because you couldn't take them to court. So it wasn't so much that they couldn't commit crimes against them. It was that they couldn't testify or be the people that sued. But if, but it was, was it still a crime then? Right. They couldn't defend themselves. Okay. Sorry. Oh yeah. So it's, I was just trying to get yeah. clear exactly yeah. what the loophole was that was allowing this. So the, what it was is that a, a, a person of African descent could not be a witness or prosecute or testify against a white person in court in most of these states. So if, if, you, if you wanted to go to court and say, look, this white person came onto my land and stole my milk cow, you couldn't do that. You weren't allowed by the laws of the land. So this made it very, very difficult, but people persevered. And uh, in some counties, there were more sympathetic white judges who would um, allow testimony to occur. I know that certainly happened in Cass County, Michigan, um, during a very infamous uh, slave raid that happened there in the late 1840s. A group of men from Kentucky came up and um, just grabbed people. It was This was one of the challenges of being a black pioneer during this period, is that even if you'd been generations free, you were basically walking wealth, right? Your, your body is worth so much money so that um, a white person could just come up and grab you and, and kidnap you and take you away um, and sell you for money. And that actually happened uh, um, a fair amount, especially in a place like Illinois, which is so close to the Mississippi River. But So the laws were stacked against them. Oftentimes, uh, their neighbors turned hostile. And after the Civil War, the Klan, some of the earliest Klan activity, this is before the 20th century, I've actually come across activities in Ohio of wealthy African-American farmers in Western Ohio, asleep in their homes with their family and having, this is in the 1870s, having men with white, you know, white hoods over their faces circle the house and start shooting into it. Oh, my gosh. And the local newspapers call it Klan. They call it Klan activity. And um, by the 1910s and 1920s, I, I don't think it is a mistake. It is not a coincidence that the Klan arises in the rural Midwest with such fierceness and such viciousness. It's interesting. I find it this intriguing because there's been long been a puzzlement on the part of historians studying the Klan in the Midwest as to why the Klan arose. And there's been arguments that maybe they were just anti-Catholic or maybe they were anti-immigrant because if historians assume there were no African-Americans in the rural Midwest. If they assume that the rural Midwest was, as some historians have argued, homogeneous, homogeneously white, then what in the world was the Klan doing out there? Well, we know now. Um, (laughs) Yeah, it seems like if you have Klan activity, you can pretty much bet that there's not just white farmers there. Right, right. But, But because these this first great migration and all of the settlements that came from it has been lost, then that 
that information has been lost too. But the interesting thing that I came across in the 20th century is that sometimes there was wishful thinking in the newspapers. Sometimes whites would write in newspapers, well, we've chased off all the African Americans or you know, we've lynched to this particular African American, so they've all left. Um, but people did not always leave. They hung on or they came back. Uh, not in all cases. And I would say that I didn't study my my job was to uncover this this lost great migration and these farming settlements and my my vision was actually I was keeping my focus pretty conservative. I was only looking at farmers, even though I was coming across a lot of rural business owners who were African American, general store owners and mill owners and blacksmiths and from you know southern Ohio to western Wisconsin, some of them immensely wealthy and successful, but I was only doing farmers, and I was so the map that's in the front of my book of over 300 settlements, those are just farming settlements. They're not urban. They're not, uh, they're not all those other businesses. It's just farms. So there's many, many, many more. And I have to say that what happened in this region in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, I think the term pogrom is not inappropriate. The level of violence that was reached in these areas, the number of people who were burned out and um, killed and lynched, it was practically open warfare in some regions. And I'm not the only historian who's noted this. Um, uh, A book that came out a number of years ago called Buried in the Bitter Waters also notes this for a couple of counties in Indiana. And of course, that infamous photograph that inspired this the song Strange Fruit is based on a photograph of a lynching not in Mississippi and not in Georgia, but in Indiana. Oh wow. In Marion, Indiana. And that photograph of those two men in the trees with the white people underneath pointing up at them like they're at a party was actually home to an early African American pioneering settlement an African-American farming settlement that by the 1840s had a thriving uh, African Methodist Episcopal church in its midst. So what is arising in the 20th century is something that was really sort of unbroken, a level of, of, white, of white hostility um, that just sort of grew to such strength that a lot of people were burned out. I've talked to some of the descendants of some of these farmers in Lyle Station, and where there are still some active clan members in southwestern Indiana. And I said, how did you survive this? And for many of them, the communities had to change. They changed from scattered farms separated by miles to homesteads in little villages. They had to. It was like the Dark Ages in, in medieval England. People had to gather together around a church and around a school to be safe. Oh my gosh. And, um, yeah, one of these farmers actually said they had a series of warning bells that they would use. And uh, I loved this quote. He said, the Klan knew we had long guns and we knew how to use them. Um, so the Klan would come and burn their crosses a mile out of town, but they wouldn't come any closer. But um, some of these settlements are still there. There, There's still, there's, um, uh, still descendants of some of these early Pioneers, free free black pioneers in western Wisconsin, just outside of uh, Viroqua, Wisconsin. Beautiful. This is a driftless region of, of Wisconsin. So these are African-American pioneers out here long before Laura Ingalls Wilder and her little house in the big woods, right? Um, they're out there and they're settling beautiful land. And one of the great joys for me was being able to actually visit these communities to see the beautiful barns that they built and the rich land that they farmed. There's long been an assumption by historians that African-Americans, pioneers that came late, they came after most whites and they got the worst or the poorest land. But actually some of the earliest African-American pioneers got some of the best land. And um, 
and it is, it's really good land. Um, I still think about a conversation I had with a descendant of one of these farmers in Western Ohio, and she was showing me around uh, a home that she and some of the other descendants of these families was working on preserving the Clemens home in Western Wisconsin. I'm uh, sorry, Western Ohio. And uh, it's a beautiful mansion, uh, absolutely gorgeous. And it's um, built with sort of a grand central hall and a beautiful staircase. And it's just lovely. And uh, she showed me around it. And and afterwards, I just turned to her and I said, nobody knows you're here. And she looked at me and she said, well, we do. <laughs> right, right. So, like, which is true, right? It's It's completely a terrible presumption for me as a historian to make, right? But the problem is, is that that's the presumption that historians have been making for far too long. Let's talk a little bit about the some of the places that you went to that you could recommend for someone else to go. So if, if um, somebody's interested in this history, and I know a lot of my listeners are in that part of the country anyway, so it might be history mm-hmm. that's in their own backyard and they can go find and they don't know um, it's there. Like uh, on the Underground Railroad episode, I, I, I shared that Harriet Tubman uh, uh, stopped at a house that was in the neighborhood that I lived in for seven years and I didn't know. Um, they discovered it later. But I don't know if I would have known at the time anyway, because it just wasn't something that was talked about that much in Philly. Um, so where where are some places that people could physically go and interact with this history, either a museum or even if it's just driving by a building that is particularly interesting? Yeah, there are so many sites and not all of them are marked. I mean, obviously, I have that map in the front of my book with over 300 settlements marked. And some of them do have historical sites and historic markers. Others don't. Uh, but they, I do, in addition to just sort of the stars on the map, I also mention their exact locations, sort of township and county. And some of these county historical societies do know of the existence of these places. But some of my favorites, and there's so many, it's hard to pick, right? Mm-hmm. But certainly one of my favorites is the Lyle Station Museum, um, a really beautifully done little museum in rural southwestern Indiana, close to Princeton, Indiana. And uh, uh, it's really well run and uh, very, very, very informative. But there's so many. Um, the Clemens Home will soon be open to the public. And that's the one I mentioned earlier, this beautiful mansion in um, just outside of Greenville, Ohio, in Dark County, Ohio. And uh, the Clemens family moved out there and bought their first 300 acres in the early 1820s and had a, a massive, owned almost 1,000 acres of land um, by the time that the original set, uh, settling family uh, died. And uh, they were truly landed gentry for that period. There's also a wonderful site that I'd recommend people visit. It's the Union Literary Institute. Um, it's practically collapsed. And it's one of the great sorrows to me, actually, is that part of the fact that this history has been lost means that a lot of these actual extraordinary historical sites have been lost, but there is work to preserve them. So the Union Literary Institute was a revolutionary school that was founded by blacks and whites in the mid-1840s in um, Eastern Ohio, just over the border, actually, from Dark County. I'm sorry, Eastern Indiana, just over the border from Dark County, Ohio. They have a good website. It's the Union Literary Institute Preservation Association. But it was a school that was a pre-collegiate institute that was open to blacks and whites, boys and girls. It was a boarding school. And uh, it was, it had, um, it allowed for sort of equal voting rights for the women on the board uh, it, it allowed for dating, uh, between, um, blacks and whites. Uh, it's just, it was an extraordinary and hopeful place at a time when so much in the country was not hopeful. So that's there. And I would strongly recommend people visit that. It's in a beautiful area of, uh, Indiana. They are really struggling to preserve it, but there's still a bit of the building left. There's the Bonin House. Uh, in Cass County, Michigan, which is a wonderful living history museum. Cass County, Michigan, by 1860, had the largest 
rural African-American settlement in the Northwest Territory states. Well over 600 African-Americans were counted as living there. There were a lot of people who did not want themselves to be counted because they had freed themselves and the law was not protecting them. So they were not going to be allowed, allowed uh, they were not going to allow themselves to be counted on any federal documents. But that's a wonderful uh, place to visit. And once a year, they do have the Underground Railroad Days in Cass County, Michigan. And it's an incredible event. They have a reenactment of the Michigan First uh, Regiment. That's the African-American Regiment that went and fought in, during the Civil War. Uh, they have amazing food. It's, it's, it's well worth a visit. Um, there's the site of New Philadelphia in Illinois, which was the first town to be planted platted and founded by African-American, an incredible man by the name of Free Frank McWhorter. And he purchased his own freedom and his family's freedom. He was a freedom entrepreneur. And by the 1830s, had platted the town of New Philadelphia, Illinois. Um, There's something, a great website called the Indiana African-American Heritage Trail, which uh, locates a lot of these farming settlements. and. uh, sort of a, a drive-by tour. The Driftless region um, of Western Wisconsin has a very good website and a map where you can travel from various locations uh, around Viroqua, Wisconsin, which is such a wonderful little community. It's difficult to get to, but once you're there, it's like a little Portland, Oregon, or San Francisco. It's um, incredible sort of farm-to-table food. It's the home of a, a massive organic farming community, uh, great little coffee shops, and this deep, deep history of African-American farmers out there. Um, oh, there's just, it's hard to know where to even, yeah, I could just go <laughs> on and on. A couple of, a couple more of my favorites, I have to say, Richmond, Indiana, which is home to Earlham College, is also home to uh, Bishop Quinn. And Bishop Quinn, um, if anybody is a fan of uh, Quentin Tarantino uh, and has saw Django Unchained, Bishop Quinn reminds me of Django Unchained. He personally helped to found over 40 uh, African Methodist Episcopal churches across the Northwest Territory states in the 1840s. And he was known for just being beautifully dressed. And he was a fantastic horse rider. He would ride a, a half wild white horse and he would gallop it into town and he would leap off its back as it reared, and he would start singing a hymn before he even hit the ground. Oh, um, wow. And he was just an incredible character. Yeah, an incredible character. And his home is in, uh, he ended up retiring in Richmond, Indiana, and there is work right now to put up an historic marker and to um, open his home as a museum. That's the Bishop Quinn home, but I know that there's information about that online. And then a very, very important national site, which really is deserving of more attention, but well worth the trip, is John Langston's home county. So this is all around Oberlin, Ohio, the college town of Oberlin, Ohio. And John Mercer Langston was the first African-American to be elected to political office in this nation. And there's there's some, been some confusion about that because I know that in Boston, there was a justice of the peace that was nominated by a committee a little bit before that. But in 1855, John Mercer Langston became the first African-American actually elected in a free and open election to political office. And I don't think it was a coincidence that he was a landowning farmer in rural, in the rural Midwest. There just was such extraordinary things happening during this period. And it was African American pioneering farmers like people like John Langston who were making so many advances in this nation at a time when such advances were impossible in the cities of the North and the Northeast, uh, truly impossible. And so he ran for and won political office. He was also the first African American lawyer in the state of Ohio. And, uh, unfortunately the farmhouse, the beautiful farmhouse that he and his wife lived in when he was elected has been allowed to crumble. But there is a small historic marker uh, near the township hall, and there is work being done to preserve the home he moved to uh, in the early 
1860s in Oberlin, Ohio. Unfortunately, it wasn't until very recently being used as student housing, so it's in really rough shape. And it, of course, I'm a history geek, right? I love history, <laughs> but I'm constantly being reminded. <laughs> I'm constantly being reminded of how we, t- how history, is laid across the landscape, and how a nation decides to commemorate its history and who lived where has so much to do with how we as a nation today and we as a people today think about who we are today, right? That um, it's just, it's so reflective of that. And so a lot of the people who are working and struggling to preserve some of these locations to celebrate some of these farmers and these families and these civil rights activists of the 1810s and 1820s and 1830s are facing the same challenges that the pioneers themselves faced. Um, and it makes me realize we still, we still got some ways to go. Um, but the John Langston home is well worth visiting in Oberlin, Ohio. It's a, a wonderful, a wonderful place and, and well worth supporting. Um, and it's a home that was visited by Frederick Douglass and so many um, luminaries of the of the time before the Civil War. So Annalisa, uh, where can people find your book? Well, my book is coming out June 12th. It's called The Bone and Sinew of the Land. And the title is actually taken from an incredible speech uh, given in the 1840s. And uh, it actually describes African-American farmers, pioneering farmers of the Midwest during that period. But it comes out June 12th. They can get it on Amazon. They can get it in most of their local bookstores. It's uh, being made widely available by Public Affairs Press, who's doing a wonderful job with it. And uh, I will actually be on book tour um, through much of the summer in both the East Coast and the Midwest, and people can check out my website, uh, www.analisacox.com, for more information about that. Or they can just Google me about locations. I know I'll be in the Boston area. I'll be in Washington, D.C. and New York City and across much of the Midwest. And I'm really, really looking forward to actually being able to talk to people about this first great migration and this long lost history. Well, that's so exciting. We'll put a link to your website in the show notes so people can look on there um, to see if there are events in their area. If you're interested in going and meeting Annalisa and um, check her website to make sure that there is an event near near you or make a trip of it, especially if it's the summer. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This was really exciting. I feel like I know so much more about uh, it's weird. It's like I've traveled to all of these places. Like I've been to all of these states, but I, you know, this isn't history that I do about. So now it's it's um, retroactively changing the way that I feel about the trips I was already on, which is a really interesting experience. But thank you so much. You are so welcome. And thank you, Stephanie, for taking the time to talk with me about this project. And I realized that the Northwest Territory states may be a long lost frontier, but It really is an exciting area, despite the fact that many people think of it as a flyover region. It's beautiful. It has a deep and amazing history. And I hope that people will begin to explore it a bit more. 